In this video, we're going to introduce the harmonic oscillator. Now, this is a quantum problem that involves any quantum product particle that is um, experiencing some sort of restorative spring force, right? Uh, specifically, it's going to be defined by the following potential energy, right? So you'll have some potential energy function uh, where you'll have one half kf x squared where that kf is going to be your spring force this is the restorative constant spring force well this is the spring constant right so um so this being your spring constant right this defines your restorative spring potential right the restorative force for your potential and so this is what it would look like graphically right and basically what you see here is a parabola um that has infinite potential on both sides of it right so this is what we actually call a parabolic potential energy so a parabolic potential energy and you might be wondering, well, why does it have this particular shape? Why is this potential shape like this? Well, if we go back to the potential energy function, right, then we can see why it has its shape. X squared, right, this uh, potential that's a function of X depends on uh, this X squared. It has this quadratic dependence on X. And we know if you, if you plot X squared, you just get a parabola. So in this case, we get this parabolic potential energy surface because of the x squared here in the potential now the other question that we might want to think about is what happens when we have different spring constants right so for example what what happens if we have a large spring constant right so a large kf let's think about what this means physically right if we kind of go back to our physical model of you know two masses on a spring Right. So if we kind of go back to that physical model of two masses on a spring, then a large spring force, a large spring constant means that you have a very stiff spring, which means it's going to be very difficult to be able to pull those masses apart. Right. So that would mean that this potential energy well, this parabolic potential energy curve would become more narrow. So if we had a large uh, KF, so I use a different color here. So for a large KF, you would end up with a narrower potential, right? So this will be for a large KF, right? So if you have a very large KF, you end up with a narrower potential. Well, that's indicative of a stiffer spring. Now I like to introduce the, you know, the sort of, uh, comparison to a diatomic molecule as well right that would be indicative of a stronger bond right so you might think that you know you might be able to, to to imagine that if we were making this analogy clean between a spring constant and a bond strength then you know some a molecule like n2 would probably have a much stiffer spring constant than something like h2 that has a weaker bond right so so yeah so that's going to be the relationship between kf and this potential energy shape and why it has that parabola shape in the first place okay now i don't want to go through like a long derivation of the energy expression uh a lot of the math for the harmonic oscillator is really super convoluted if you want to find it online you can probably find it uh but i think it's just really uh, uh useful for you to understand the the qualitative nature of this right so we've discussed the parabolic shape the energy expression has the following form so the energy is going to depend on a quantum number new so each each quantum problem that we discuss we will introduce a new quantum number for the translational motion we had n and here we're going to use the greek letter new which the harmonic oscillators energy is going to depend on the energy is going to be new plus one half times h bar omega Right, where again, omega here is that angular frequency. Right, so angular frequency omega. And again, it's related to the, uh, the spring force, Kf over M 
raised to the one half power, right? So, so this is the energy expression for the harmonic oscillator. Now there are two really, uh, well, actually three really key features here for the harmonic oscillator energy. The first is kind of zeroing in on this, uh, this quantum number new here. New can actually start at zero. Right, so we can go from zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 right? Why is it that it can start at zero? Well, it's interesting, right? So if you, with the particle in the box or the free particle, if it had a, a quantum number of zero, then it would have been um, completely, it you wouldn't have had an energy, right? Which is something that we can't have quantum mechanically. Every particle has to have some latent energy, um, attached to it. So, um, so with that, uh, with a harmonic oscillator, you can actually have a zero, uh, quantum number here without having a zero energy, right? So if we were to plug in zero here, if we had E sub zero, that would just be one half HW, H bar W. Right. So um, kind of sticking with what we learned in the last couple units, right, this will be our zero point energy. Our lowest possible energy is actually when nu is equal to zero. This is our zero point energy. Right. So nu can equal zero. That gives us this zero point energy that is actually related to when the quantum number itself is zero. Right. And the other thing that I want to mention is about the spacing between different levels. Right. And you can kind of we can go through a few numeric exercises here just to to prove it to you, you can prove it in general. But let's just kind of prove it to ourselves. So let's say that we had one. Right. Let's say we had new is equal to one. Right. So that's going to give us three halves H bar omega. E2 would give us five halves H bar omega. Right. E3 will give us seven halves H bar omega. Are you, are you noticing a trend? Hopefully you are. What the trend that I'm trying to show here is that the spacing between levels is exactly the same. If you subtract E0, E1 minus E0, you get H bar omega. If you subtract E2 from E1, you get H bar Omega. If you subtract E3 from E2, you also get H bar Omega, right? So on and so forth, right? All of the adjacent energy levels have the exact same energy. So what that'll look like for us, if we were to superimpose these energy levels onto our diagram here, right? We will have our zero point energy down here at one half H bar Omega. Then we'll have the next one, right? and the next one, and I'm trying my hardest to have the same spacing between each each one, Oop, failing, but you get the picture, right? So, um, so between each of these levels is a gap of H bar omega, right? Consistent spacing between the energy levels, right? Um, at least for the, for the simple quantum harmonic oscillator, that means that if you're going, uh, uh, energy excitations between um, adjacent levels, should be the exact same energy. It should require the exact same energy, right? Um, okay, so we have our potential, we have our energy. Let's uh, discuss the Hamiltonian really quick. So the Hamiltonian for the quantum harmonic oscillator, it's going to be negative H bar squared over two mu, where mu is the reduced mass, which we just had a full video on the reduced mass, right? D squared, DX squared, plus, kf x squared one half kf x squared right so we have our kinetic energy operator here which is very similar to a free particle except instead of using the mass of the particle we're using the reduced mass of our oscillator and then the second term is just the potential which we've just talked about here so obviously if we wanted to plug this into a schrodinger equation then we would have negative h bar squared over two mu d psi dx squared, right? So the uh, second derivative of psi with respect to x plus one half kfx squared psi is equal to e psi, right? So that would be our Schrodinger equation for the uh, one-dimensional 
quantum harmonic oscillator, right? Um, okay, so hopefully this gives you a good introduction to the physical problem of the quantum harmonic oscillator. We went over the potential, the energy levels, and the Hamiltonian. In the next video, we're going to introduce the wave function for the harmonic oscillator. And just like the approach I took here, like I said, a lot of the math gets really involved and really dicey with uh, deriving the energy levels and with deriving the wave function. So I'm gonna take a different approach of just looking qualitatively, making a qualitative argument to why the, the structure of the harmonic oscillator wave function makes sense.